Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isvron, and with me today is Mike McDaniel, Dean for the Western Michigan University Cooley Law School. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Heather. It's great to be here. Well, you're also a former, uh, former general. That's true. And an alum of our master's program. Yes, yes. Best thing I ever did. So much experience all in one package. Oh, thank you. That's kind of you. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about leading through chaos. And you were a linchpin in the 2014 uh, Michigan, the Flint, Michigan water crisis. So today we really want to talk about how that all happened, just kind of reframing it a little bit, and then kind of what you saw that our leaders across the country can really learn from. Sure, I'm really happy to talk about that. A little bit of background, as you said, the water crisis really started in 2014 when the uh, financial emergency manager appointed by the governor for the city of Flint decided to save money that they would no longer buy their water from the Great Lakes Water Authority, which used to be the Detroit Water Authority, but they were going to use their own water treatment plant and use the Flint River. Uh, great idea, but the water treatment plant had not been used actively in about 25 years. And it wasn't just the infrastructure that had aged. There was a loss of personnel who had the experience to do the water chemistry, which as I learned was very complex. So they started all up with not really any practice time. And for a period of two years or so, it was really from uh, early uh, uh, April or so of 2014 to about October of 2015 that they were using the water system from Flint with Flint River water and they had problems. It was really with the water chemistry. They had too high a chlorine, and it was corroding the engine blocks for the for the General Motors engine plant. Hmm. Uh, they had too high of rust and, and other things in the water, so the water is coming out with the chlorine. It's smelling. With the rust, of course, it's turning orange. And what was also happening was that they hadn't put the anti-leaching material, the chlorophosphates that line the pipes, these older pipes, so that they don't leach metal from the pipes into the water. They had forgotten to put that into the pipes as well. And as a result of that, there was elevated leads, in some cases, astronomically high levels of lead in the drinking water in people's homes, which were only discovered slowly through the efforts of local public health officials, and even they were not being listened to. And that's what caused this crisis, which really blew up in very late 2015. Uh, in January of 2016, I was appointed by the governor to be on his task force, which he had started of local folks. And uh, I was appointed by the mayor to be her liaison with the governor's office. As a former Homeland Security Advisor for the state, I knew most of the people that were still in Lansing in government. So I was acting as that liaison because there was no communication uh, except through the media between uh, the, the state and, and the city. And there's no trust and there was, there was just no rapport being built. So that was the starting point. So when we say this is sort of a black swan event, um, it's one of those things which in retrospect should have been expected, but was completely unexpected. There is uh, somewhere around, uh, one study says 5,300 cities in the United States that have similarly high levels of lead. That is lead uh, in the water where it's above 15 parts per billion for at least 10 uh, percent of the homes of a municipal water system. Mm -hmm. There's about 50,000 water systems in the United States that are municipally owned, so about 10 percent of them are at risk. So, you know, for our, our, our listeners out there, yeah. that's a huge proportion that they should be concerned about as well. And I, I want to go all the way back to that decision point of, hey, let's use Flint water you know, and who that person was. And, and I think that's a real um, common thing. So, you know, people are trying to save money. We have less resources. Most of our critical infrastructure is, you know, it's not a big secret. It's really aged, as you mentioned in right. the study. So when those decisions are made, are the proper protocols in place to ensure something like this doesn't happen again, you know? Right, that's a great question because uh, everybody's got aging infrastructure. You know, the, the, the length for our, our water distribution lines is somewhere around 50 to 80 years at the, out, at the outside at the most. In both Detroit and Flint, we still have water mains that are made out of wood yeah. in some areas. They're like old barrels. And they work as long as the water pressure inside is greater than the water pressure outside. 
as we saw in the in the uh, the blackout back in 2005 in Flint, the system shut down from the lack of, of electricity and, and the backup systems weren't working. Water seeps in from the you know the external groundwater is very high in Michigan. Water seeps in, the whole thing's contaminated. So the biggest problem with the blackout back in 2005 in Detroit wasn't the loss of electricity, which was only for a few days. It was the fact that the water system was shut down for over two weeks because then you had to go through and flush the entire system to get it back up. So I use that as an example. We have the same sort of wood, wooden pipes in some places in Flint. It's the infrastructure that we sort of keep, as, we as leaders keep saying, we'll deal with that tomorrow. We'll kick that can down yeah. the road. We've got more immediate needs. It's the idea uh, to put in the emergency management sort of scenario, it's we don't want to spend the money on prevention. You know, we'll spend the gov federal government's money on response, and that's exactly what happened with the Flint water system. Or we'll take the risk that something might. We'll take might, the risk for as long as we can. What's yeah. there? Yeah. yeah so. and, and 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 you're right. The risk is never fully identified. Right. And if you never fully identify the risk, then you never are able to be prepared. Obviously. And that's exactly what happens. You know, all of our folks work for some sort of city council or state legislature, and they know that this is this is the issue. It's that that first part is educating that greater group of stakeholders on what that risk that they're really accepting is. Very difficult to do. And and. I guess I, I'm trying to wrap my head around, you know, we've been in government a long time, you know, you have those cuts, everybody hears about cuts, 10% across the board, right. with no idea of exactly those risks that they're taking. Uh, are, other than being aware that it's a little more complicated than they might seem, um, would you have any t understanding or tips for our folks on how they could better become aware? Is it at the legislative level? Is it just complicated and dependent upon the jurisdiction? You know, I think that it is incumbent upon us in emergency management, homeland security uh, community, in leadership in that community to really understand the whole of government. You know, the other disciplines aren't necessarily tugging on our coattails and saying, you know, here's what I do. Uh, and the ones like Department of Public Works, and especially, you know, they just want to do their job and you know, don't bother me. They don't even see a connection to emergency management. Exactly. And I'm sure there are other disciplines like that too. You know, it's only recently that we have really embraced public health in the fold. Uh, and, and so I think it's a matter of we have to know the secondary effects of these, of these inactions. You know, we always sort of army war college, we always preach about what are the effects of these courses of action. Well, we don't really think as much about what are the secondary effects of courses of inaction. Mm. And that's the thing that we have to be able to educate our leadership on uh, that I don't think that we are doing. Mm. Well, hopefully people take a look at this. And I hope so. I learn hope so. From it. So we have that part of it. And now we have the actual crisis occurring. And there you are in the middle of it. And when you get on the ground, and, you, and this is for folks, you know, who are in those events, and it's, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. The complexity right. Is, right. is too much. Uh, what would you suggest in terms of an overall strategy for a leader? Right. Again, dependent on the responsibilities, but you had quite a few. Sure, but any any leader, I think, senior leader in emergency management or homeland security could be thrown into that same environment. There's no one person. I mean, we can't all be trained for every event that's going to occur. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. Um, so in this case, you know, it was a matter of marshalling as many facts as you can, to, trying to understand what the scope of the problem is and then the scope of the resources available. Uh, and, and of course, in this case, this was overlaying this were different levels of government and distrust among many different levels of government. You know, we had EPA both as a regulator, regulator and uh, we had EPA as a scientist, and one the scientist is more helpful than the regulator, um, and the city was not paying attention to the difference there. Uh, we had the state, which um, because the, the emergency, the financial emergency manager was appointed by the governor, was seen as the state was in charge, and the state was saying, well, wait a minute, you know, it's your water system that's being used with your your employees. So we had all layers of government that were really unable to talk to each other. Uh, I think that's another area of Homeland Security and Emergency Management where we have preached interagency and intergovernmental right from the beginning. 
uh, that means that you are more likely to have somebody from the Homeland Security uh, um, um, community have to step up and take the lead. So then you have, of course, just an incredible, overwhelming uh, level of uh, media and individual attention. Um, people divide into communities naturally, uh -huh. uh, and these communities may seem to be anti the city, uh -huh. but you have to see what they're really pro and what they really wanted was safe drinking water. So once you sort of agree on that goal, it's how do you achieve that goal? Right. Um, so the, the, the big picture there, I think, is that we have to be extremely adaptive uh, in terms of what are our resources, including personnel, as well as systems, functions, uh, uh, and funds. Uh, and then we have to be able to uh, sort of use our, our planning skills uh, on the fly and sort of say, okay, who are my stakeholders? What's our common goal? And once you build that, then you've got, um, then you've got at least the start of a path towards some sort of success. So in this case, the state's original position was, we're going to provide bottled water. It's sort of a response activity. We're giving everybody bottled water right away, and then we're going to await um, further testing while we, we add the, the anti-leaching agent, the chlorophosphate, the line, the pipes, while we wait for that to take effect. I sort of jumped to, uh, to, to EPA scientists and said, what's the best thing to do here? They tell me about Washington, D.C., how long it took to do that as, as a previous case, case study to look at. And one of the questions that was posed to me by EPA scientist Miguel Del Toro was, where's the greatest concentration of lead? If you're trying to get the lead out, where's the greatest concentration of lead? What well, was in the service lines? So the city immediately seized upon that uh, within less than two weeks of starting, uh, the mayor and I held a press conference and said, we're going to replace all the service lines. I didn't know how many service lines there were. I didn't know how long it was going to take. Uh, but I knew that we had to say, make a bold, definitive statement that here's our goal and, and here's how we're going to meet that goal. My estimate was there was about 18,000 service lines that need to be replaced and that we could do 6,000 a year. That was a swag. Right. It was truly a swag. I had, again, no resources, no ability to do this, and no funds from anyone at this point. Um, but you had to have that goal. And then so the, sec the, the second thing you have to do is get the state to agree with that, and they did. And the, the Department of Environmental Quality funded some early research, including replacing some pipes right away. And I brought in an outside outfit, uh, uh, the city of Lansing, whom I knew well, I knew the mayor well. We had them come in who had started to do this on a periodical basis. They took the opposite approach and they said, we're going to replace all our service lines over a 10 year period and doing about a thousand a year. Which is a good preventative Which, with great strategy. Great preventative strategy that they happened to be there, uh, innovative, you know, adapted, they were on top of it. So I brought them in to show how it was done to all the contractors. It was a free seminar for all the contractors that might bid on this contract on how to do it um, because we were trying to do it as quickly as possible and, and as, as l less, the least amount of uh, destructive or disruptive technology. So we weren't trenching people's yards. We were gonna pull the pipe out underground or abandon it and drill, horizontal drill and put a new pipe in. Um, so we had to have this training seminar uh, by City of Lansing on how to do that. And of course we did that where we're replacing a service line for a family uh, that, made, that, that needed it right away. They had a small child, you know, the wife was pregnant, it made sense to do that. So you have to have that early success. But then you have to have uh, the bigger issue that we had was once you have the success, the question still is where do you start? Yeah. You know, so everybody wants their, their pipes replaced immediately. So you have to have a, you have to have some solid criteria. So that actually took a little bit of time. Obviously, we had to spend some time there. And what we ended up doing was coming up with criteria that public health officials could agree on. It's lead. Who does lead affect the most? Well, those with compromised immune systems, uh, those that uh, were very young. So we looked at those under six, the elderly. Um, and uh, we looked at those where we had the kids that had, or we wanted to look at where the kids had uh, the, the lead in the blood that had been found by public health. Mm. Well, the first category, uh, those with compromised immune systems and kids that had the blood test, we never got that. 
I'm sure there was a HIPAA workaround. I didn't have time to sit down there and work through the, the bureaucracy to do a HIPAA workaround. So instead we said, okay, we're working on these other criteria. Uh, we, we can tell where all the kids under six are. We can tell where the elderly are. And we did that based on the 2014 census data. Uh, and, we, and then we looked at um, construction ages. We went to the construction records to say, all right, wh when were all the houses built that would have lead pipes? That's when we had our, our greatest surprise, and that was the city had no complete records hmm. of when work was done on the home. What they did starting back in the 1920s was whenever work was done on a home's water system, the city water department had an index card and they wrote on it with pencil what was done at that home. Wow. And they continue that to the present day. So, Are you kidding me? It, no. And so when somebody would come in and get a permit to do further work on that home, they do another index card. So we had maybe 55,000 residences, residential properties in the city of Flint. And we had 140,000 cards and they were all as analog as could be. So it was a matter of saying, okay, we've got to parallel track this. We had to, at the same time, we had to start digitizing those records and we had to figure out a way to, to go forward without digitizing those records. So based upon the sampling of the residential homes that the Department of Environmental Quality was doing, which would tell us the composition of the pipes and the age of the homes, we were able to make some very broad assumptions about uh, homes between these years were, are the most likely to have lead pipes so that we'd have a starting point. Right. Well, I want to go back to the two points that really resonate with me. When you were talking about what people need to remember when they're in the middle of chaos. Yes. What I saw from the press accounts and, you know, the aftermath was that there was a trust. You, you have to have a face of trust and transparency. And so it seems to me in, a, in an event like this, the first thing to do is to have somebody that can stand up. And, and if you absolutely have no resources, have a goal, have a vision that you can build towards. It may not always, you know, it's definitely going to have index cards and right. crazy things that happen yep. to it. But having that goal um, is really important. And hopefully the media, and I want to talk to you about the media, um, was able to understand that. I mean, it's not, it's not blood, it doesn't, you know, fill the front page, but it is right. correct and right. it's transparent. So tell me about that. How, how did the media work with you? So I, I don't know that they really worked with me, but I will say um, that there was a complete breakdown of trust in any level of government by the citizens of Flint. Uh, there is a uh, long history of environmental inequality there, uh, going back to the siting of, of auto plants and other plants, for example. So there was a distrust of uh, uh, outside corporations. There was a distrust of, of government. Um, that was deep-seated within the community. So when the water system doesn't work, um, you know, that goes to a very basic human need. You've got to have yeah. water to drink, to, to clean your food, and, and to bathe. If, and when you can't trust the water, everybody's scared. And, of course, then everybody's going to attribute any illness to the water, whether it makes sense from a public health or epidemiological standpoint or not. Um, so right from the beginning, uh, it was clear. I mean, I just knew intuitively that I had to, usually with the mayor, I mean, it doesn't make sense for it to, to be me because I'm going to leave at some point. I was only there two years, uh, but the mayor is going to be there for at least four years mm -hmm. and maybe longer, right? So uh, in conjunction with the mayor, with other city officials on occasion, uh, we had a press conference within two weeks, like I said, announce what we were going to do. Um, uh, they said, how are you going to do it? And I said, I don't know, but I know that this is our goal. The mayor and I were both new. She had just appointed me in January of 2016. She had just been elected in November of 2015. So we weren't perceived as part of the problem. Hmm. We, had to, we had to gain people's trust that we would be part of the solution. And that's still a long way to go when there's an inherent distrust in government uh, across the city. Uh, and in any older urban city uh, that's been ignored for years. Uh, so that first press conference, we had questions that we, we didn't know the answer to, and you have to tell them you don't know the answer to. I don't have resources. I don't have funding. I don't have personnel. Uh, and none of that ever really happened 
to the extent that you wanted it to, but that's okay. You keep moving forward with what you have. Um, and so you can never be defensive. Uh, you have to be very open. Uh, I would get calls on my personal cell phone from the press. I'd take all those calls any time of day or night. Uh, you have to be fully engaged with them so that they are explaining to everyone out in the community uh, exactly what we're doing. And if they see that something's not happening, why? Uh, secondly, we did town halls and they were ugly. Mm. I mean, there is a lot of venting of anger and fear. We did some in conjunction with state government. They might have been uglier, at least earlier on. And then some we did alone. Uh, and, and it was a matter of explaining to everybody what needed to be done. Uh, thirdly, uh, you're going to get individual calls. I mean, we had to set up a website and a phone number so that people could call in and complain. My neighbor's house had the service line replaced. Mine was not. Why not? You left mud or there are tire tracks on my lawn. The smallest stuff, you still had to be able to respond to that and respond to it quickly because you're trying to rebuild trust. Uh, I think trust has been, as of today, in 2018, I think trust has been rebuilt in the city government, in the mayor's office. I don't know that the trust has been rebuilt in the water itself, um, even though I think the water is safe to drink. The point I want to make for our community is that you have to try and make the media your partner. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't get that message out alone. Uh, we tried as many different uh, media uh, means of media as we could. We put yard signs out saying we're coming to this neighborhood or this street next. Uh, we had AERP volunteers that walked the streets and, and did the knock on the doors because they were members of the community as opposed to having you know, the contractors themselves who were outside. Um, when the contractors came, uh, they kn they, it was known who they were. They had to wear identifying uh, equipment, an ID card, as well as a shirt, a safety vest, something that named the company. The names of the company and the streets that they were going to be addressing next were all on the city webpage. Um, we tried as many things as we could uh, to, to get that message out. Uh, we, we tried to buy ads on Facebook. I had the money to do it, but the c city council wouldn't approve it. It mm. was... There is, a, there is an ongoing battle with the city council and the mayor's office. And of course they had to approve any funding and that's how um, uh, they were able to sort of slow, slow things down a little bit, um, which was another issue. Uh, again, uh, I saw this as a public health crisis. Uh, and so you look for workarounds uh, around the bureaucracy as much as you can. Um, so uh, I, I had a tense relationship with the city council, uh, but I was accepting of that, knowing that I was going to keep finding workarounds, and at some point the, 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 the public uh, impetus was going to be such that they were going to have to approve um, uh, almost all of uh, the things that I wanted them to do. I, again, it wasn't city money, it was either state or federal grant funds, but they still had to go through the city council. Mm -hmm. So that was another issue. So I think that the big issues here are, um, don't look at only the resources that you currently have or the staff you currently have. If it's a true black swan, by definition, the resources and staff you have are going to be insufficient. So you have to look at it as broadly as possible. Uh, for example, I immediately embraced the academic community. Mm -hmm. uh, the local university, University of Michigan Flint, had a great earth science department. So uh, I had no funds, remember, so they put together the GIS programs for me. So I had these really good heat maps, other maps of tracking the water flow, that sort of thing. Uh, again, these are hard copy. Um, but that's because I'm going to town meetings in, in communities that don't have a, you know, an AV system, any sort of audiovisual system or a computer system to project it. So I'm hand carrying, you know, three by five foot posters around to the different meetings. Um, I used uh, University of Michigan Ann Arbor, the Department of Com Computer Science, uh, accepted the challenge of how do we figure out where to move next uh, to replace the service lines across the city. Uh, and they came up, they got it, they went out independently, got a grant from Google to go out and, and create an algorithm. And based upon that, they created a survey sheet that we would then use with the contractors where you'd go around and we had these series of questions that were on iPads. 
which we made the contractor supply. We gave them the program, and each household had to answer a series of questions before we could do, replace their water line. And by doing that, by doing that then, we were creating an online digitized water record you know, system of all the service index lines cards. that the city didn't have, so we didn't have to use those index cards. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that you have to be very adaptive um, just by definition if it's a black swan. Excellent. Well, my last question is, now that you've been through it, it's a few years later, and obviously uh, it, it was a completely complex yeah. and probably still ongoing event, uh, what, what are your takeaways in terms of as you led through that? What did you learn personally? One of the things that I learned personally was the need for patience. We certainly talk about our stakeholders, but often we just sort of give them lip service. And what I learned is, if they're stakeholders, their opinions matter. And so first you have to identify all the stakeholder groups and they're not going to be obvious who they are. Uh, some of the most important stakeholder groups were neighborhood associations and organizations and then the local churches. You know, with uh, There's a lot of different churches in, in Flint and you've got to touch base with their pastors. That's sort of the, you know, that's the center of gravity, I think, within the city are the pastors. So you've got to talk to all these groups and you really have to listen to them. And that takes a while, you know, because people have to process a new idea. But if you get their buy-in, you're a lot farther down the road. So you can have an objective, but if it's your objective, then you've got to make it their objective too. And that requires them to work through it all. Really good advice. So it, it, that's really difficult. It, it's very time consuming and you've got a lot of little, you know, tactical issues that you want to be working on at the same time. You know, it was getting a, a, a request for proposals, you know, through the state uh, budget office, approved through them so that we could use state grant funds for it. You know, you've got all these little issues that you're working on, but you can't neglect, you know, keeping your, your, your sight on your strategic goal and everybody that's needed for the strategic goal, which is a lot different from what you're doing down on the street, you know, just replacing pipes. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I don't know about wisdom, but at least a little experience. Okay. Thank you. Take care.